morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hey, there we go. We're good to go now. No feedback. <laughs> so, uh, it's good to see every one of you here this morning, uh, whether you're online or joining us here in person. Uh, welcome, and I, I pray that uh, God's peace and blessing and uh, His Spirit would rest upon you this morning as we worship together in the Lord's day. If you take a minute, uh, if you haven't already, just take a look at the uh, Connect card in your bulletin. Uh, if you haven't uh, uh, said hello, this is your opportunity uh, to do that. Um, and, and just to let us know that you're here. Let us know uh, how we can better serve you. Uh, you can write that on the back side and, and just drop it off in the uh, offering plate as that uh, comes around this morning. Uh, I won't go through all the announcements in the bulletin, but I do want to highlight uh, that all of our uh, Sunday school classes will be resuming on September 11th, as uh, that's kind of our uh, kickoff day, and also that we, uh, we will be starting an adult small group uh, for college age and older. Um, those young at heart uh, of all ages can, can, can come uh, and be a part of that group, uh, college age and older. And we will be meeting at the Flower House, um, every other Friday starting uh, September 16th at 7 p.m. So if you are interested, uh, please feel free to sign up. Uh, even if you can't, you know, you know, there's certain weeks that you can't make it, that's fine. But if you're interested, go ahead and sign up on the bulletin board. There's a sign-up sheet out here in the hallway um, so we can be uh, as best prepared as possible uh, to host you well uh, that evening. So uh, please feel free to do that. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church? Fine. The thing with uh, Reverend Lola, the scam? Yes, so um, there have been some uh, emails uh, sent around. Uh, you may have received one from Reverend Loda uh, asking uh, to buy things for her on Amazon. Um, that is a scam. Uh, her email has been hacked, and so um, please pay pay special attention to uh, your emails. If it looks like uh, its words aren't spelled correctly or um, the punctuation is out of place or if it just looks a little bit uh, fishy, chances are it is. Uh, and if you have any further questions, come see me and we can kind of walk through some of those details together so that uh, you also don't experience some of the same uh, hardships that others have been experiencing through that. Any others? Let's worship God this morning. Please join me for the call of worship. Praise the Lord, my soul. All oh, my must be. Praise, praise the praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Redeems your life with the pen and crowns you love with air and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Praise the Lord, my soul. The hymn of praise will be, I'm so glad Jesus loved me. Join me with the unison 
Lord, the Lord is the Let us not miss your invitation of presence and peace. You call each of us by name. Let us not shrink back in fear at the sound of your voice, but approach you with boldness and expectation. Give us the courage to listen and respond, even when others try to thwart your plan. And as we experience our healing now, let us praise you with hearts full of wonder, joy, and adoration. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among all the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. The anthem is God possible by Sidney Luke.
Trinity, thank you, Donna. That was powerful, wasn't it? Let us continue to worship God in His majesty and glory and splendor through the tithes and offerings that we have come to give Him this morning. have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn there uh, now to Luke chapter 13, uh, or you can uh, borrow one of the Bibles in the, in the pews if you uh, are in need of one, uh, or use your devices from your phones as we read uh, God's, before we read God's Word together, uh, we will be uh, lifting up before God and one another our prayers and praises uh, this morning. Uh, prayer, as I said last week, is important part of not only what we do here as Reno Church, but it's an important part of our identity and who we are in Christ. And so let us share before God and one another our praises and our prayers this morning. Yes? Karen Kunak, who just had hip surgery. Karen Kunak, who just had hip surgery. Keep in prayer. Uh, we want to keep in prayer uh, Diane Frank. Uh, she is home. I talked to her yesterday evening, uh, really worn out from the last week, as you could imagine, her and John both are, but she uh, is recovering, and things are going well, all things considered, and so we certainly give God praise uh, for his hand upon a uh, feeling upon her, both her and John, uh, in this time. Sir. Many thanks to those who pray for Caleb, who's doing Yes, thank you. Uh, Caleb kind of gets these uh, uh, seasonal allergies that really affect uh, his asthma, and so uh, he begins to cough and can turn it, you know, being in daycare, being around all the kiddos and the teachers, uh, that just can kind of create the perfect storm, and so that's why uh, he wasn't here with us last week, but uh, the fever has gone down, the cough is going down as well, and so we uh, praise God. 
God for all of your prayers and, and texts and support and through this time. It's fun. The woman who delivers our on Valley Independent every morning, uh, she has a older, much older, severely challenged son who's with her. She left us a note in the paper yesterday that she would be delivering Tuesday's paper very late because her granddaughter, for whom she is the uh, guardian, is having major surgery of some sort, and she needs to be there in case there are decisions. So this woman's been carrying the burden for a long time. She's very nice. What was her name and her granddaughter's name? I don't know. It's, uh, she's just the woman who delivers the paper every morning. And she's very nice. It's you know, very simple. If I read it in the story, she always be happy. She was all over it. The, uh, the newspaper delivery woman that uh, drops by uh, on Debbie's house, uh, her granddaughter is undergoing some uh, very serious surgery uh, that's coming up. And so we want to keep her and her granddaughter uh, especially in our prayers you know, this morning. Also, um, Cindy is recovering and doing much better with the COVID. Cindy is uh, recovering uh, not only from Aruba, but also uh, <laughs> from the, uh, the COVID and uh, wishes I think she were back in Aruba at this yeah, time. Sure. But uh, she yeah. just uh, talked to her the other day as well. And uh, thanks you all for your prayers. Yes, uh, students and staff go back to school for taking help. All the students, staff, teachers, uh, as they get ready for the upcoming year, we uh, pray a blessing upon you all and also a hand of God's uh, protection, uh, not only from uh, the threats of illness and disease, but any kind of threat that may uh, dare to impose itself uh, in our school districts. Kenny Kumar had his surgery on the 26th. Tony said it went well. They removed his one console and some surrounding tissue. And the doctor says he feels that they got everything, but they still have to wait for the pathology to come back. Kenny Kumar uh, had his surgery and everything went well. Uh, the doctors think that they uh, got everything, but they're still waiting on some further testing and results just to make sure. Uh, so we uh, praise God for uh, great uh, procedural reports, but uh, also in this time of waiting as we wait for the funds to work. Beth? Yeah, um, thanks for the prayers for my brother-in-law, Don. He is coming along. He's in the rehab, and he's getting there. It's a long, slow process. And Summer, the same. Thanks for the prayers. She's getting there. Um, she actually did a little bit more yesterday than she has. And school starts for her tomorrow on crutches, so it's going to be difficult, I'm sure. <laughs> Don and uh, Summer are both in rehab for various uh, <laughs> conditions and reasons, but uh, we're glad that they are on the men's and, and doing well in their uh, healing and, and rehab uh, rehabilitation. So we praise God for all of that. Let's go to God. as we prepare our hearts. Let us rest in God's presence. Let us feel His Spirit.
but yet on the worst days. We're never too far beyond the reach of grace. So let us, Lord, come and sit in your presence. Bind us, reshape us, mold us into your image. So we seek to become more like you. Who is the Lord of the Sabbath? Let us hear the words I love you. Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had, had, had 
disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all of his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, you came to earth to offer us a life changing invitation of becoming your disciples. And through your witness, you've taught us how to live. And by your love, you have shown that this way is of great cost. But because of your love for us, Lord, you in your death and in your resurrection, we can now rejoice for the salvation and the rest that only you can give. To you we give all thanks and glory and honor and praise. Amen. This morning we're going to revisit Luke 13, which is a part of the much larger uh, story of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. His primary mission, as we said last week, was to seek and to save the lost. And we read that back in chapter 4, that Jesus was given all power and authority by God through the Holy Spirit to proclaim God's good news, to give sight to the blind, to set at liberty the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. One of the ways this happened was through healing and release. And our passage from Luke 13 tells us of one of these accounts. Last time our main point was that whether you see yourself as the bent over woman or the religious leader, Jesus has the power and the authority to notice you and to heal you and to set you free. And we also said that this wasn't just a, a quick fix cure, but that the release of Jesus causes us to glorify God, giving all praise and honor to Him. And so when we looked at verses 10 through 13 last time, our focus was on the bent over woman, helpless, as her body had been stuck in a position of weakness for 18 years. And that the condition was due to a binding of Satan. This woman was helpless. She needed to be set free from the disease that weakened and even crippled her. This woman could not see in front of her own face. But yet, Jesus noticed her. He healed her. And he set her free so that she could go on about her merry way, right? So that immediately she would give all praise and glory to God that flowed out of her heart. And that's exactly what this beloved daughter of Abraham did. In this passage and in Luke, there's an important thematic thread that runs throughout Luke's gospel that we need to pay attention to today, and that has to do with seeing Jesus. It's interesting, this seeing of Jesus, because it's not always about physical eyesight. It's about the attitude and the receptivity of the heart. To respond to what God is already doing in our midst, and to respond to the ways that God is calling us to experience Him again and again, refreshed and renewed. 
To put it another way, it's about recognizing the time of our visitation, as Jesus says later in Luke 19. The Sabbath healing story in Luke is the only place that this story is recorded. And it's interesting who sees Jesus. Because those we think who plainly see Jesus for who he is are blind as a bat. And those we may anticipate needing the most help are right at the center of the action. That in their helplessness, they are the ones free to see Jesus most clearly as he is to be seen. Before we go any further, I want to highlight something just before we dig in. And that relates to Sabbath. When we hear the word Sabbath, Luke automatically wants to place us in the broader story of God beginning with creation. In the very beginning, God existed as one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then in the void of darkness, God created. For six days, God created. The sixth day being the creation of man and woman in God's own image, joining them together for his good purposes, not only for being fruitful and multiplying, but to steward everything he had made and given them. And on the seventh day, God rested. And on the seventh day, God set it apart as blessed and as holy. And the Sabbath was a day that God would be honored and call his people to remember again and again. He would call them to remember the conflict and entrance of sin, eventually leading to the darkness of slavery in Egypt. But with a strong hand and a mighty arm, God set his people free from their captivity. It was the Sabbath day that they were to remember always, to remember that in their helplessness without God, the grace of God went before them to deliver and establish them, and to be reminded of the covenant that God had established with his people, first given to Abraham, that his descendants would be his people, and that he would be their God. One divinely created community of faith gathered together. Conflict of helplessness due to captivity of sin. And God's redeeming covenant of grace. Community, conflict, and covenant. Those are the three words I want you to remember today as we walk together through Luke 13 and talking about the religious leader. We're introduced to him in verse 14, and Luke doesn't necessarily paint for us the most favorable picture of this person. But then, I think we have to realize that we need to take a closer look. We need to take a look, closer look at the man, what Jesus is providing, and a closer look at ourselves, because perhaps we might see more of ourselves in this man than we readily care to admit. The adjective Luke uses in verse 14 to describe this uh, individual is indignant. To be honest, I had to look this word up, but what I found was astonishing and also convicting. Merriam-Webster defines indignant as a feeling or showing anger because something unjust or unworthy has taken place. To describe it differently, another definition I read uh, was that indignant is a feeling or showing of anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. And so I think there's something in each of these definitions that we can all relate to. And if you discover that you're more like the religious leader than you thought, remember that Jesus has the power and the authority to notice you, to heal you, and to set you free. I wonder what the religious leader thought as the scene unfolded. So if you will, picture the situation with me. People are entering the sanctuary. Maybe someone like 
Donna and Cindy Lou are providing some sort of musical accompaniment or background music. And maybe the men are discussing uh, the latest golf hacks on how to get through the back nine at Butler's. Maybe the women are, are trading recipes for the upcoming church festival. But then Jesus stands up, reads from the scroll, sits down, and begins to teach the people. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stops, and the people pay attention. And as they do, they see him notice a woman and call her forward. And when he calls her forward, there was no hesitation. And I wonder how many people would have ever thought that a miracle was just around the corner. As the synagogue leader watched Jesus encounter, I imagine that time for him probably stood still. But as Jesus' actions progressed, the leader was probably gritting his teeth, blood boiling, and you know that, that vein that just protrudes <laughs> from the forehead was probably in full effect. The leader had a choice in how he was going to respond. So would he choose to see Jesus in the way in which Jesus was revealing himself? Except that a conflict had occurred. Jesus was disrupting this picture-perfect worship service. This man, this religious leader, he organized it, picked out all the hymns and the scriptures, and everything was just neat and orderly. And now the mood had entirely shifted. And I think if we're to step back from the situation, it might become easy for us to see that the leader also, not just the woman, but the synagogue leader also needed to be set free. But what was it that he needed to be set free from? He needed his own Sabbath day deliverance. He needed his own reorientation of creation and conflict and covenant. See, the synagogue leader, as Luke already told us, was indignant. He was already fired up that Jesus, to him, had already stepped in, out of line, in addressing this woman, let alone calling her over to him and healing her of her disabling condition. And remember our earlier definition of indignant? Annoyance or anger due to unfair treatment. Well, Jesus had some anger and annoying issues of his own. Verse 15. Hypocrites! Jesus responded. And if you notice, hypocrites is in the plural. It's not just directed to the synagogue leader, but to all who are present. The entire community. Hypocrites. I had to look that one up too, just to be sure. It basically means pretender. To put yourself out there is something that you're really not. In other words, this community has talked to talk, but they're not really walking the walk. You call yourself a gathered community of God's people, but you're not acting like it, Jesus says. You may have a community of faith, you may be a community of faith, but it's a community misguided. And so there's a false sense of community here. Community design, it needs to design and function in the way God intended. So now, we have a conflict, don't we? But what exactly is the conflict over? Is it about worship styles? Is it about the fact that Jesus healed on the Sabbath? What is, what is the conflict? We may have a community. But now there's one present, this woman who totally for a reason beyond her own desire or control is unable to fully participate in that community. So now what do you do? How does a person who is looked upon uh, as seen on the outside of that community, seen but maybe not heard, how does that she become a part of the community of God? God's people so that she can fully participate. The real issue in this sense, then, is how am I able to be a part of this thing on my own? By my own works? Or must I go about this some other way? How do I obtain status within this community? 
And so the synagogue leader, trying with all his might to bring some sense of order and perhaps sterility back to the moment, uh, says, maybe pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, we don't do that sort of thing here. We already got everything set. We've got our songs, our prayers, our rituals. This uh, really isn't the time or the place. But if she wants to leave her name and number with that person over there for after the service, we'll be happy to set up a time for this kind of monkey business to continue later. We may snicker and sneer. But how do we see this happen? When it relates to miraculous works of healing and deliverance. What Jesus is, what the synagogue leader is really saying is that the work of redemption needn't be concerned with matters of worship. I've got my religion, and that's good enough. But Jesus begs to differ. And so in a way, he's asking, how far are you willing to go to see that one of your community members, one of my beloved, receives the healing and release that she needs to be a part of my community? And maybe they've tried. Maybe they've said all the things they know and done all the things that they know. But for 18 years, this has been the effect. And so this is where the covenant of grace steps in. See, the community under the synagogue leadership, mind you, uh, they um, thought that they could get by on their own terms, their own rituals, and that if you didn't fit the mold, oh well bad for you. But now I want to be clear that Jesus isn't diminishing the importance of God's laws by any means. In our passage, Jesus clearly shows that both God's law and people are important. However, rules should never undermine the identity or worth of a person. And in this case, Jesus doesn't break the rules regarding the Sabbath. He embodies the Sabbath and who he is and what the Sabbath was meant for, and experiencing the presence of God through rest and healing and saving and worshiping the Lord. What Jesus does do is break through the darkness and disease to bring his woman, this woman and the community into what it means to worship God in light of spirit and truth. As Jesus says in Matthew, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And Jesus has come to fulfill the law with his life. Jesus reorients Sabbath rest, or even Sabbath works, in terms of caring for. He alludes to the extent which one will go to care for an animal because that animal means everything. It is a source of livelihood. It is a source of food. It is a source of sacrificial offering. And Jesus says if that animal means that much to you, the people around you, should be even offered greater care. On the Sabbath, the focus is not what actions humans can do, or even what we can do for ourselves, but on what Jesus can do because of who he is. And by the way, in fact, the fact that we worship on Sunday as our Sabbath is no accident. That it was determined from the early church that we would worship our God on the day that Christ rose from the dead, holding the keys of hell in his hands, that day we must remember always and be thankful. Beloved, Jesus desires a connection with each of us, that we gather together with him and under him as a community. And God desires connection and relationship with us and our community that is so special, so intimate, that is a closeness that is never meant to be broken. A coming together so that no one, no person, no temptation, no acts of destruction or divisiveness or evil can get in between to pull us apart. And only, that can only happen when Jesus' authority and power have disrupted our lives to the point that we have no other choice but to live under This is also the design for the church. The word Jesus uh, used in, um, that Luke used for, for synagogue is 
the same root that gives us this connection of uh, doing or suffering together out of a common experience. That the church is not merely a joining together and ingathering of persons in a, a physical building, but a uniting of all believers that have been established for worshiping in spirit and truth, walking together in unity, whether upon straight and level paths or through the hardships of suffering. In this joining together as believers in Christ, we are forming a spiritual union with Him, that we may commune with Him and be one with Him as we carry out His kingdom work. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing in His teaching that led to His healing in our passage. And I would also argue that Jesus wasn't merely enacting the importance of believers gathering together in the presence of the church for the Sabbath. But how to live beyond the walls of the church? How to be the visible manifestation of Christ's presence in the world? Because beloved brokenness is the inevitable thread that weaves itself to our lives. Brokenness is the place where all of us enter the world. But brokenness is only the starting point. God never wants to leave us in brokenness. Because that's exactly the same world that Jesus enters. His own entrance into our world begins through what appears to be an act of scandal. But God's plan is not to leave us sent away leave us in the sinfulness of our hearts, in the hurts of our past, in the pains of our present, that God's plan is to reconcile us and restore us back to himself, to be reconciled with one another. Because it was grace and love that Christ came and died for us while we were yet sinners. In his own act of divine mercy, Jesus says, the road I'm taking to Jerusalem now is the journey that I'm making I will take the thorns that have tempted you, and I will place them upon my head. I will wear them pressed into my brow, not as my shame, but as my crown. And in exchange, I will offer you a crown of righteousness. As the blood runs down my face, I will remember you, and I will remember you as I take the weight of any shame or guilt or condemnation that crushes your soul as I bear it and endure it upon the cross, offering forgiveness for the sin that leaves you broken and bonded. My broken body and poured out blood will be the Sabbath healing that you will experience as I draw you together in my name. And as you experience this, remember me as I have remembered you, and be thankful. If you find yourself this morning like the religious leader, Jesus says to you, I noticed you. In fact, you're the very reason I came to this earth. And I want to give you a future that is filled with hope and peace and joy and love. And I want to free you, but I can't do that if you're constantly trying to complicate or ignore or restrict my offer of release and salvation because I'm the only one that can truly heal. I'm the only one that can truly provide release and save you. You might be able to go to a physical therapist for your aching body. You might be able to take medicine for your health condition. You might be able to participate in different social clubs or recreational activities to enhance your emotional and physical well-being. But how is it with your soul? Will you see Jesus today the same way he sees you? Jesus is saying to all of us, come, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Draw close to me. Offer me your hearts, your burdens, your needs, your future dreams. Because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And in my rest, when you lay down everything at my feet, I 
can give you new life. And in this new life, we will begin to dance together. Let's pray. Almighty God, glorious and awesome and wonderful is your name. And in your name, there's a power to break every chain that keeps us from worshiping you. Every chain that holds us back in fear. Every chain that tries to get us to place ourselves above you. Lord, there's so much that we want to try to get right in pleasing you. But the harder we try, the further we may ultimately miss your offer of freedom and release that is right in front of us. Lord, help us to see that true Sabbath rest and peace is not something that we can do, but it's only something that is offered to us by your grace. Let us be humble. Let us be broken. Let us be helpless. May we experience your compassion and your grace as you notice us, heal us, and set us free. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing together our closing hymn, The Lord of the Dance, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Number 261.
and call the day holy. So since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So let us, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in every time of need. Go in God's peace, and may the peace of God go with you this day. Amen.